Can you dig old Satchmo swinging in the beautiful high society? You dig. There is one thing I want understood right now. No member of my family is to invite Dexter Haven into this house until after I am married and gone. I will not have my wedding spoiled by intruders. If you will allow a reporter and a, a photographer into your home to cover Tracy's wedding... Is he out of his mind? Intimate pictures of my wedding in that barbershop magazine? It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. <laughs> And welcome to Ticklish Business. I'm Kristen Lopez, joined as always by Emily Edwards and Samantha Ellis. Ladies, how are you? Great. So excited to talk about this movie. I it's can't your birthday. Wait Yay. We were supposed to have a guest. Maureen Lee Lanker was supposed to be here, but unfortunately, her schedule, she's a very, very busy woman. So we were not able to get her on. But we love Maureen and we will definitely have her on in a future episode. Because it's Samantha's birthday, we decided that we needed to discuss one of Samantha's favorite films, 1956's High Society. But before we talk about High Society, Grace Kelly, Samantha's birthday, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, then you should. We do additional bonus pods, including doubled features, looking at remakes based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime, including our upcoming series, looking at literary adaptations we're calling it but have you read the book but in this case we will not be reading the books we are just going to be looking at the various films so it's going to be something fun and different looking at a lot of british literature this time out we also give out regular care packages of movies gifts pins totes and let you guess on an episode it's a patreon.com slash ticklish biz don't forget both emily and i have books out that you can order wherever you get books And our new Redbubble store has some fabulous art, all designed by Samantha Ellis and Terrence Hiltz, featuring your favorite stars, including our popular Makoko mugs and our Myrna Loy. Welcome to the Loy side items. You can find that at ticklishbiz.redbubble.com. High Society! This is a movie that I know Samantha loves to bits, but we're all going to preface this that we are all friends outside of this podcast. No one movie can tear us apart. And even if people do not love this movie, we still love each other. Just putting that out there in the spirit of closeness and friendship. Because Samantha already knows how I feel about this film. I will admit, I didn't quite fully grasp your feelings on this movie until I saw your letterboxed reading the other day. I don't think I've ever been so sad to see someone else letterbox rating for a movie in my life. Letterbox destroying friendships one rating at a time. We've talked about this before. I love that we disagree so darn much. It's the best. It's the best thing for this podcast, really. But I also just have never seen such a huge discrepancy between two ratings. I give this movie a full five stars. I don't want to spoil. I don't want to speak for you, Kristen. Kristen gave this a two and a half. Which actually was half a star more than the first time I saw it when it was two stars. I gave it an extra half when I rewatched it. Maybe I am just way too nice and way too generous with my ratings, but I feel like two and a half I've probably given to 10 out of five to 700 movies I've seen on Letterboxd. Two and a half is an it's okay. In Kristen speak, two and a half is it's fine. This might be the biggest gulf between you and I with regards to a movie. Most of the time, if you've listened to the show long enough, Samantha convinced me to watch something that I usually in turn love, like Cry Havoc or the VIPs. Her and I tend to have very similar tastes. We do not when it comes to this film at all. But we're going to get into this in a second. I want to throw the plot out before we start talking lovingly and maybe not so lovingly about this. This is directed by Charles Walters, who did quite a few Esther Williams films that I do love. This is a remake of the Philadelphia story that originally starred Catherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart and Cary Grant. I can't believe I almost forgot him. Based on the play, this remake tells the same story. Tracy Lord is a socialite who is about to remarry and her ex-husband 
has 48 hours to convince her not to get married. Bing Crosby plays the Cary Grant character, C.K. Dexter Haven. Frank Sinatra plays the reporter that is sent to spy on them and maybe get some gossip that was originally played by Jimmy Stewart. And Grace Kelly is our Catherine Hepburn, Tracy Lord. I want to let Samantha go first. She is the birthday girl. Why do you love this movie so, so, so much? Okay, so I think my perfect answer to this is... I am incredibly biased. This is probably one of maybe two or three times in my life where I've sat back and watched a movie and felt like it was made specifically for me. The main character's name is Samantha. It's like all kinds of ridiculous romantic mishaps, very reminiscent of the adorable 50s MGM musicals that I love, but also the Astaire and Rogers that are some of my favorites too. Just the cast, Grace Kelly is my all-time favorite actress, and I'm probably going to say this several times, but this is my favorite Grace Kelly film for so many reasons. She just displays such a great range. I could go on and on about, she won the Oscar for The Country Girl, and there's so much controversy about that. But at the same time, we always talk about throughout the history of the Oscars that comedic performances and musical performances never really get recognized or awarded. I was just telling my fiance about this right before I jumped on. Grace Kelly in this movie, she has to play drunk and funny at the same time, which is so hard. That's just a lot more difficult than simply playing sad like she does in The Country Girl, for example. This movie really goes under the radar in terms of Grace Kelly specifically. The songs, Louis Armstrong, Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, This being the only movie where Frank and Bing sing a song together. How amazing is that? The Technicolor, the cinematography, the costumes. This is a perfect movie for me. I could go on and on. Another thing that Samantha and I vehemently disagree on, Grace Kelly's Oscar win for The Country Girl. I knew. That's why I'm talking about this. My take on the whole 1954 Oscar situation is that Judy Garland should have won an Oscar long before that. While A Star is yeah. is probably her best film, she should have gotten an Oscar way before that. So it shouldn't have even been a conversation. Such a big reason why people debate about it and why people are so upset about it is because it's considered her best performance and she did not have an Oscar, aside from the juvenile Oscar for The Wizard of Oz at that point. I think if she had an Oscar under her belt when Grace Kelly won, I don't think it would be as much of a debate. And I don't think it would be as heated as it is now. I think it would still be heated, much like the Sidney Poitier snub from the In the Heat of the Night episode. That's the female equivalent in many ways. Emily, you had not seen this. And I know you were texting us commentary here and there, which I was actually hoping for more because I needed to know your thought process. What did you think of this? Okay, so the text that I sent when I started this was, I'm from New England, but you have to know that going into this. And so I could spot Newport from a mile away. You know where it is. And so I'm watching this beautiful helicopter shot of all the mansions in Newport coming into perspective. And all of a sudden there's Calypso music overhead. And I was just like, Quap? What is happening here? Because Calypso and Newport, Rhode Island do not go together. I was really confused because I had to make sure that I was watching the correct movie. And so I texted you guys and I was like, this is right, right? And you were like, yes, it is. Finally, it explains why we're in Newport and there's Calypso music. And after that, I was on board. I do have to say, though, that I am a super fan of the Philadelphia story. It is possibly one of my favorite movies of all time. And much like Samantha feels about Grace Kelly, I feel about Katherine Hepburn. She is my absolute icon of femininity on screen because she is just so smart and so sassy and brilliant and strong all the time in most of her, especially early younger presentations on screen. So I just love Kate so much. And so I'm going into this comparing it to the Philadelphia story. And again, Kate and Cary Grant are just absolute matinee idols to me. And so it's really hard to top that. I loved the positioning of it being during the Newport Jazz Festival, which is something that I think is really, really interesting. It was a really cool way to get Louis Armstrong into the story. 
It was an excuse for them to be in mansions, which is always really, really nice. If you don't know a lot about the money of Philadelphia, you might wonder why in the Philadelphia story where all these rich people came from, because a lot of people don't consider Philadelphia to be an incredibly wealthy city. That was a lovely way to position this and get in these gorgeous mansions and these rich people, idle rich hijinks. There were mentions in the movie that took me out of it of the spiel that she's giving Frank Sinatra of you should really feel bad for all of us rich people who have to sell our country homes, our country estates for taxes, which I was like, that's a 1950s thing that didn't really exist in the Philadelphia story. But by and large, I can see why you love this movie. It's frothy without being saccharine. It is fun. Grace Kelly, she's very good in the role, but she's not Catherine Hepburn for me. So I see why she's very good. I have some issues with the male casting of one specific male cast in particular. And then I will go on to say that I love Frank Sinatra with the red hot passion of 10,000 burning suns in this role. But that's also because I don't really like Jimmy Stewart usually. Samantha, I know. I'll get into it. I'm probably the middle ground between you two where it's like, oh, I really, really like this but it's not holding up to the original picture for me because you really can't get much better than a George Cooker comedy with Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn. That is a pinnacle of classic film. See, I totally understand where you're coming from. I have always noticed and felt that the biggest criticisms that high society gets is that it's not the Philadelphia story, which is so understandable. I totally get that. Katherine Hepburn is so great. Cary Grant is so great. Jimmy Stewart is so great. I don't know what you're talking about. I say this because I'm literally, the people on Twitter might know this. I'm working through Jimmy Stewart's filmography as we speak. So that hurt me. (laughs) I'll just say that I often find it difficult to believe that Jimmy Stewart is playing in every man because he does have a very specific way of talking that is a very wealthy way of speaking in the early 1900s that when he plays an aw shucks every guy, I just find that very difficult to believe. He is like Harvey when he's playing someone who is incredibly wealthy, comes from a batty, wealthy background. I find that much more easy to believe for Jimmy Stewart than when he's playing the aw shucks newspaper reporter in Philadelphia Story. I remember you liking him as the villain in After the Thin Man. Yeah, because again, that's a very wealthy character. Whereas I feel like if he plays someone who's upper crust, it comes more naturally to Jimmy Stewart in the way he speaks and the language that he speaks with. Whereas I know that he made his career bread and butter by being the aw shucks every guy. But for some reason, that just doesn't mesh with the way he speaks. But that's just a me thing. We're going to talk about people not meshing with their characters in this movie. (laughs) I can't say I look at Jimmy Stewart and think wealth. I don't know. Maybe we're just seeing two different things there, but I'm surprised by that. I honestly think the opposite. The aw shucks makes me think poor education. (laughs) Building on what we were talking about, the comparisons between the Philadelphia story and high society. Again, also super biased. I love George Cukor a lot. However, Charles Walters is up there in my top 10 favorite directors as well. He just was so capable. He made some of the absolute best musicals of that decade. High Society being one of them. A lot of people, like I was saying, say High Society is no Philadelphia story. My argument, I honestly believe that High Society has taken the Philadelphia story's great script, a lot of the really great bare bones of what made it so wonderful, and built upon it. I hate to say that's how I feel. You're really just adding things here. You're adding color. You're adding songs. You're adding a new, pretty vibrant cast. You're adding Louis Armstrong. I'm here for all of that. I'm not against any of that. I will say that Charles Walters is probably the ticklish business director we have discussed so far the most often. We just recently did Good News, which is a Charles Walters directed film. He did Easter Parade, which we've talked about. Charles Walters is one of those who does a lot of musicals that I should like, but I don't, much like Easter Parade. He did Summer Stock. He did Texas Carnival. Summer Stock is great. Texas Carnival is a lot of fun. Dangerous I love when Texas wet. Carnival. That's why I love Charles Walters so much, because he directed so many of them. He did Dangerous When Wet, which is my second favorite Esther Williams movie. Maybe my first, actually. 
Easy to Love, The Tender Trap. He worked with Sinatra before this on that film. He did Gigi, which is a movie that historically I just do not like. And The Unsickable Molly Brown, which we did our episode devoted to Debbie Reynolds on. Charles Walters is pretty much the Chicklish Biz director mascot at this point. As far as my thoughts on the movie, it goes to what Emily was saying, only a bit more convoluted. You cannot be the Philadelphia story at all. What the Philadelphia story does so skillfully is takes that comedy of manners that you got your dinner at eights in the 30s and builds upon them in a way that it's high concept, but not too high concept. It's fun and frothy in a way that feels somewhat relatable. My biggest issue with this is that there are so many egos in this movie, and that is part of the problem that I have. You have Bing Crosby, Grace Kelly, Frank Sinatra. That's your holy trinity. Historically, all three of them are huge, huge, huge freaking names that require a lot of finesse. My problem is, is that this is an hour 45 minute movie, which is about the same amount of time as the Philadelphia story. And yet this feels longer because you have to get songs in for Bing. You got to get songs in for Frank. You got to get a song in for Grace. I didn't even know Grace Kelly could sing until I saw this movie. You got poor Celeste Holm there sitting in the background. We got to give her something to do. It just always feels like these are not actors in an ensemble, but three big monster A-list actors trying to figure out who gets the most time. They're all on the same line on the poster. No one is meant to be above the other, but they are all jockeying for time. I can just kind of see them elbowing each other metaphorically behind the scenes. This is the Ocean's Eleven of the 1950s, where you just have some huge talents that need all of this time. That is ultimately the problem. The age difference is a big thing, too, especially because everybody's in color, and Bing and Frank are looking a little long in the tooth. I never really buy that her and Bing have chemistry, but neither do her and Frank. Frank Sinatra can usually have some chemistry with somebody. Frank and Bing have more chemistry between the two of them. I would wait for them to run off together. I feel that they have more of an impact than anyone does with Grace, which is sad because I've seen Grace Kelly have some sizzling chemistry. If you've seen The Swan with her and it's Louis Jordan, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. That, so great. that one's good. Everybody's hot. I recommend that one. I've tried twice. I always keep thinking, get the Philadelphia story out of my head. I made a good faith effort, Samantha. I tried. Gave it an extra half, but it's Still never, never works for me. Kristen, I have no idea what you're I'm talking sorry. about. <laughs> and it's just so funny to just come on two polar opposite sides of this because I don't want to be the person that spreads the tabloid stuff about these actors. And I don't want to be the person that believes that Grace Kelly slept with every single one of her co-stars. But you're saying that she had no chemistry with Frank Sinatra or Bing Crosby when Bing Crosby proposed to her in real life less than two years before this. And then Grace went on to have a decades long affair, supposedly with Frank after this. (laughs) Well, see, that's interesting because I had read that the Bing and Grace thing, everybody knows about that. But I had read somewhere, it might be on Wiki, that Frank did not have a relationship with Grace Kelly because he didn't want to follow up Bing Crosby. (laughs) Who knows what's true or not? But maybe it's Bing. Maybe the problem isn't her. Maybe it's Bing. Because I don't think Bing Crosby tends to have chemistry with any of the women that I've seen him opposite. But maybe that's also because I've read that Bing Crosby was a horrible human being. I don't know. Maybe the problem is him. That's definitely possible. I will say if I could point out two issues with this movie that I do have, as perfect as I think it is, I'm still going to give it five stars every time I watch it personally. Because like I said, I think it was made for me. I just love it beginning to end. But my two issues with this movie, one of them is being specifically that really creepy song that he sings to the little girl. Dude! (laughs) That song needs to just be cut out of the movie. I understand the intention back then, but it's just aged like milk. Is it ironic that Charles Walters also did Gigi, which has Kevin for little girls in it? (laughs) The other really interesting thing that I think about, I don't know how many modern movie fans listen to us, but when I think about this was redone on Broadway in the early mid 2000s and Anna Kendrick played that role of the little girl. 
I'm trying to imagine that on Broadway, someone singing to a tiny Anna Kendrick. <laughs> I mean, it like could have been Anna Kendrick now. Me. She's still tiny. Yeah. That's one of my issues with the movie is that weird song that Ben sings. My other issue, two words, first name, last name, John Lund. I just hate that. <laughs> he is the definition of milk toast. Right. We're going to talk about that. They That's could have like just so much more of a dynamic actor. I don't know if they ran out of budget or what, getting Grace and Bing and Frank and Louie. They just had to get some nobody to play the actual guy she's marrying, for lack of a better actor. If they had put Louis Jordan in there, this would have been a very different movie. (laughs) That's always my big thing. I get the point of getting a John Lund. He's your Wendell Corey. He's your Ralph Bellamy. He's your Bill Pullman for your 90s kids out there. You need somebody that is lit. But the problem is... He has to be a little unlikable, right? Yes. For us to root for the other two. But at the same time, you have to believe that a woman like Grace Kelly's character would be interested in him. I have no idea what the interest... I need a scene of the two of them meeting to know what alchemy went into her deciding that she needs to be with him. That's why there was so much exposition about her needing to marry someone who works his way up from the bottom. Whereas, oh, she's trying to prove something by marrying this specific guy. And it has nothing to do with him, where he's just the person who hits the check marks of, no, I'm just not a society girl. See, I can marry someone who grew up broke. I see what they were doing, but oh, golly, they could have put a slightly more charismatic guy. The other thing that I always pick up on when I watch this movie, and I don't know if you guys did, John Lund definitely comes off a little evil. There's definitely some kind of plot going on in his brain behind the scenes that he's just going to take over this dad's company (laughs) once he marries Grace Kelly. That's the hint that they're trying to tell us. Definitely see that. And I don't think it's because of the unfortunate coloring of his hair that looks fake in the technicolor here. One of the things that I was really struck by, you bring up the weird song to the little girl Age is a real factor in this movie, more so than it was in the Philadelphia story. In case you want to know ages here, I wrote them down. Bing was 53 when he made this. Frank was 41. Grace was 26, 27. And I don't know how old John Lund was, but I'm assuming he was probably closer to 40. 40, mid 40s. And compared to the Philadelphia story, where I think the ages were a bit closer in comparison, is the much of the reason that Tracy is the character she is, is that she is holier than thou. She wants to be perfect. She is this pristine character. And in the Philadelphia story, when characters bring that up, CK Dexter Haven brings that up as a negative, and Frank Sinatra's character sees it as this interesting benefit. But it's mostly the older men, like her dad, that are telling her, you're hard. And you need to let that guard down or else you're going to die alone. Whereas here, because all of the men, her love interests are so older than her, it just comes off a little odd that John Lund is like, I just want to worship you. I don't know what weird sugar baby lifestyle we're going to be having here, sir, but it just is a little weird. And then Bing Crosby keeps reminding her throughout, one day you could make a fine woman. You could be normal. She's 26, okay? You're 53. I don't want to hear about you molding some young girl to be your wife. The age difference becomes a plot point. Without making a point of it, it becomes a thing. And that is very, very difficult when the whole point of the movie is watching Tracy Lord lose that pristine facade and actually be a person. You know what? I think the lesson that these men are trying to impart on her in their own sick, twisted, sexist way is you need to be a little nicer to others and accept that maybe sometimes other people can make mistakes and you should still love them unconditionally. That's the lesson that they're trying to impart, but they just say it in the worst way possible. (laughs) If Bing had just gone up to her and said, you should be a little nicer to people and accept that your future husband might make some mistakes and maybe you'll all be a little better off. 
If he had put it that way, then I don't think that he would be coming off as sexist as he is. But gosh, the way that he says it is not great. He needs to work on his delivery. And so does her dad. Everybody does. Every man in this movie does. Both movies do such an interesting job of juxtaposing Tracy's marriages against her parents' marriage. And it's just so interesting that they always say, well, your dad is having an affair with a burlesque dancer. That's the same thing as you being unhappy that your husband doesn't put his dirty clothes in the hamper. No, those are two very different things. You always ask, they, no movie ever goes into this of what does CK Dexter Haven do to Tracy to make her divorce him or to make the marriage crumble? everybody's trying to say it's totally fine that your dad is cheating on your mom with a burlesque dancer in the city. She eventually comes around and says, there's only two people in a marriage. And I guess it's fine if my mom thinks it's fine. That's where both movies end up. But CK Dexter Haven, how many burlesque dancers did you have in the city to make Tracy abscond and get out of this marriage? The only exposition that we're given regarding the dissolving of their marriage is that C.K. Dexter Haven and in high society didn't live up to his full potential as a musician. He's putting out all this jukebox stuff that Tracy thinks is beneath her. She thinks he could be like a real composer. But I don't think that's enough to ruin a marriage and it's definitely not as bad as somebody cheating. (laughs) In this movie, and again, it goes back to the creepy age differences here. Louis Calhoun plays Uncle Willie which is more of this grandfatherly character in the Philadelphia story that shows up. And in this movie, he's lusting after Celeste Holmes, Elizabeth Embry, who is the other reporter who was played by Ruth Hussey in the original film. Now, mind you, Celeste Holmes was 39 when she made this. So she was not a young woman, but Loon Calhoun ain't 39. He is an old man. There's some bottom pinch-in or something during a dance sequence, and I'm just like, "Mm, nope, not cool with that. Emily, you bring up one of the big issues that I have with this movie is that the original film starts with that really great sequence of what I call loving domestic violence, as only the 1940s could do it, where Catherine Hepburn comes out, she breaks his golf club across her knee, and then he comes and he grabs her face and shoves her down. And that's the dissolve of their marriage. Without belaboring the point, you understand that both of them had issues, they responded badly, and that is what has caused their marriage to deteriorate. You don't have that scene in here. You have Louis Armstrong giving his Calypso-tinged exposition of who these characters are as if we're not going to know who they are. There's no weight to the drama of their relationship. It all just unfairly lands on, this is Tracy's problem. Every bad thing that's ever happened is Tracy's fault. The movie never really contradicts that. The only real exposition we get is that extended sequence on the true love. This movie tries to show a lot more than it needs to. But even then, it doesn't really hint at their problems. It's just more of this really nice romantic sequence where you get to see them be in love and they sing a song. So there's really never any weight to why they got divorced in the first place. What is changing that causes them to get back together and why they would ultimately want to get married again? It's just Tracy needs to change. And as we all know, in 2023, if your relationship problems are chalked up to only you need to change, I don't need to change, just you, that does not have the longstanding ramifications of a happy marriage that I would think. Have you joined Ticklish Business Patreon? You should, just like Ali Moore, Amy Hart. Andrew Hoppy, Christine Meyer, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Jacob Haller, Jonathan Watkins, Kimma, Krista Painter, Mick F., and Rachel Clark. Listen to episodes 48 hours early, receive exclusive membership items, and even guests on an episode. You also get access to bonus features like Based on a True Podcast, Doubled Features, and our new limited series, But Have You Read That? It's all at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. That's definitely true. The other thing that's definitely glaring when you stop and think about it is, of course, that they haven't learned anything. (laughs) They get married. And as I was saying, if they had any issues, their issues were that C.K. Dexter Haven wasn't living up to his full potential. He was, as she was saying, a jukebox hero. She was so offended, which was hilarious. (laughs) 
do we think he's not going to be one now that they're married? Has he suddenly become highbrow? Is he going to be making different music that appeals to her taste? No, we have no indication of that at all. It's just, as you said, Tracy realizes that she maybe doesn't need to be so hard on people. She's the only one that changes for the better, (laughs) which is unfortunate. It's better than her ending up with a guy that she barely knows and a guy that's obviously out for her father's company. Emily, I want to ask, being Crosby in this movie, F-boy? Classic film F-boy? I think so, just because he has a lot of the hallmarks of Louis Armstrong asks him in the beginning of how did you get this house? And he says, well, this is what happens when your grandfather is a robber baron. So he's coming from a place of absolute astronomical familial wealth, which is generally not the source of goodness in most American media. He certainly has machinations of being an absolute F-boy, especially when Tracy explicitly tells him, stay away from my house. I don't want you coming here. I am going to get married. And the worst thing in the world would be for my ex-husband, who is obviously still in love with me, to continue to come over and try to change my mind. Do I think changing her mind is a good thing? Yes. Do I think that the character did it in a good way if they were real people? No. Do I think it makes an excellent movie? Yes. So I'm always torn about this. If he was a real person, run far away and change your phone number. But since he's not a real person, I'm kind of fine with it. The only thing I want to add to that is, I don't want to spoil too much if people haven't seen this, but the ending... She cares so much about how people perceive her and the fact that he is willing to remarry her and go through all of this again with her just to save her face is really sweet. (laughs) It makes her for a really cute ending. I do have to bring up, though, Emily points out something good, which is that he does come from a ridiculous amount of money. Knowing this is Newport and I just go the Gossip Girl route, I get the sneaking suspicion that they wouldn't have ever gotten divorced in the first place because he's still got a lot of money. She's got a lot of money. I could see this just being a marriage of convenience. Whereas in the actual like Philadelphia story, she comes from money and he's just someone who's a part of the wealthy set. C.K. Dexter Haven's actual career in the Philadelphia story is that he's a boat designer and a yacht maker. So he knows how to infiltrate the upper crust but he's not necessarily part of them. Whereas this, they are on completely equal wealth footing. They both have mansions on the walk and they are incredibly wealthy people. It seems much more natural for her just to say, sure, I'll go with Bing's CK Dexter Haven as opposed to the Philadelphia story where that was probably a rebellious marriage to begin with and that he didn't necessarily fit in with her set. Even though Her entire family did like him, especially the younger sister and the mom. How can you not? He's Cary Grant. Whereas this is slightly more of just, well, why wouldn't you marry the boy next door, even though he's 20 some odd years your senior, because we are on the same footing. I definitely get the vibe that Tracy feels ashamed to have married CK Dexter Haven after the fact in high society. She definitely gets to the point where she wants nothing to do with him and thinks that he's just not even in her league, which is crazy. One of the things I have to admit, and I know you guys are probably going to disagree with me on this, that I didn't love about the Philadelphia story that I think I find high society a lot more palatable. When you get a brain like Katherine Hepburn and Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart all together, and they're delivering this incredibly highbrow dialogue and just really snappy, intelligent lines. It goes right over my head (laughs) in Philadelphia's story, I have to admit. In high society, you can look at their combined IQ and it's significantly less. So hearing them say these words is a lot more palatable for me. It's just easier for me to digest. In addition to the color and the song, it's such a witty, beautiful script. 
But I just think it has to stand on its own in the original. And in the remake, there's a lot to support it and make it, again, easier to digest, which I know is such a weird opinion to have. No, it shows the changes in screenwriting styles between the 40s and the 50s, which was a very huge shift because you're getting TV by this point in the 1950s. So the way people talked did change. My big frustration with this movie is that my favorite dialogue exchange in the Philadelphia story is not included in here which it's the sequence where Tracy gets really drunk and James Stewart Macaulay Connor shows up and they have this great complex romantical dialogue we've talked before about Jimmy Stewart horniness it does not happen often but it happens in the Philadelphia story where he goes on this whole monologue about how obsessed he is with her and how he thinks that he's in love with her and he uses the term hearth fires and holocausts and it is just the most romantical moment where i'm like damn that sounds good you are great jimmy they don't have that in this movie frank sings her a song and that's how they have that exchange so you'll also have the rise of rock and roll coming in the 1950s so telling somebody you love them through music becomes more paramount to a teen audience around this time. So I wonder how much of that factored in. I totally get the changes in the usage of dialogue and how it works to this film's effect. My big hang up, though, in my one complaint about Grace, because she is utterly beautiful, the Helen Rose gowns are fantastic, is that I feel she tries to talk like Katherine Hepburn. The accent is very bizarre in this movie, the way she's talking. I don't know if that's meant to be highbrow or if that's meant to be a Hepburn imitation, but it was very, very weird. Like the last vestiges of the mid-Atlantic with a little bit of British. I don't know if that's because she had been spending so much time in Monaco. Madonna can tell you about that. I don't really know, but it was very, very distracting to me. That never occurred to me. That's not something that I ever picked up on until you just said it. It does make a lot of sense now. I definitely hear it now that I'm listening back on her dialogue in my head. She sounds much more posh than she has in any of her other movies. But as you were kind of mentioning, a huge contributing factor to that is that this is her last movie before she went to Monaco. Maybe she just was becoming more refined as a person and had the pressure to be so. Maybe it's not a Catherine imitation, but it could be. It could be. I will actually give that to you. I keep defending Grace. The one thing that shocks me when people criticize this movie, a lot of people criticize her casting specifically. That's so strange because a lot of people throw around the term ice queen or ice princess when it came to Grace. Catherine could be described similarly. They played a very similar type of role back then. In their respective niches. For people to say that she was miscast is honestly kind of shocking. Yeah, Kate was almost always called unfeeling, unsexy. Men didn't want to be with Katherine Hepburn. That's not generally how she was cast. I just love Katherine Hepburn through and through. She's always so intelligent. She's always so with it. She's always so prepared. She's always so capable on screen. I really like Grace in this role, even if I could remove my love for Katherine Hepburn from the role. Grace Kelly is a really good casting for it because she does this thing very well where when she's opposite Cary Grant in To Catch a Thief, where she plays a debutante so well, where you can just imagine her just being like, take care of that for me. And someone does because she looks like Grace Kelly and she has a 10 carat diamond ring on her hand. I could not take my eyes off of the entire time I was watching this movie. She plays spoiled rich really well, but not in a mean way where it's like, she's so beautiful. You can't imagine any point in her life where she would just say, can I have a Coca-Cola? And it just didn't appear. And that's this character through and through, where she's so used to just saying like, why would the entire world stop for me? And that's really excellent in the role of Tracy Lord. It's different from how Kate played her, but I do really like her in this role. I just don't like Bing. 
That's understandable. The pairing of Bing and Frank is a little odd because of the huge age gap between the two of them as well. But I think it's just the perfect opportunity to put them both in a movie. As for Grace, this role really played to the misconceptions of her as a person. That regalness, that aloofness, that coolness that wasn't actually Grace in person, but that's how everybody perceived her to be. And honestly, I think that makes her perfect for this role. And again, I'm just so biased when I say that because she's my favorite, but this is my favorite role of Grace. There is just so much range that you see. I love that she's even able to show off her engagement ring in a scene. She wears it through the whole movie, but there's one scene with the pillow where you just, wow, it's right in your face. Jewelry fan, I love that too. You mentioned earlier the scene where she has to be funny and drunk, and you're right. That is so hard to do. She's playing this delightful champagne fizzy drunk, and it's never like she's doing something that's against her will or against her type. This is just the walls are coming down. She gets to be silly. She gets to be desirable. She gets to have as many men who could possibly want her fawn all over her. And you really get the sense that this is not a weird or exposed drunk. This is a, oh, you're finally having one night where you're allowed to let loose. You got a little bit of liquid courage and you're figuring out who you are. And she does it so well in this scene when she starts climbing out the window and she gets her foot stuck in her dress. And you can just see her be like, oh, fooey, because she wasn't expecting this to happen. And it's probably the first time she's ever been clumsy in her life. And then when Frank Sinatra greets her on the porch, he is so from Hoboken. He is so beneath her in every possible way. And he's just like, let's facilitate you going bad for an evening. And I loved those scenes because he's so the perfect casting for her in that position where I could put Frank Sinatra in the Philadelphia story and actually take out Jimmy Stewart, I would be thrilled. That would be ideal, 100% perfect casting for me. Frank sings in this, literally and figuratively. My big hang up with this is that it comes after On the Town and Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Frank, at this point in 53, playing a reporter for a magazine that's gritty and he's trying to get the story that's not the frank i see in 53 i almost wish we had gotten frank in the late 40s when he was still playing loveless guys that struggled to get a girl that i could work out better in this role and then i would just want gene kelly to play the bing crosby part because i think that might have been a better fit because here as mike connor which i love that they're like his name's not macaulay we gotta call him mike because Sinatra only played salt of the earth guys. He's a bit too hardened. There's a bit more of a divide between him and Bing and Grace. He just seems like an outlier. The fact that we've spent the majority of this episode not even talking about his presence. He's just there. I don't feel that this role is really much for him. There was a lot of talk that him and Crosby feuded while making this, but TCM has debunked that and said that, no, they got along very well. The song that they sing does show a lot of their chemistry, that they do have some fun and some humor between the two of them, and it's just lost. I never buy that Frank Sinatra has a chance in hell of getting Grace Kelly in this movie, unlike in the Philadelphia story where I believe James Stewart maybe had a shot. They ever had a chance I- yeah, to be young. <laughs> this with you even in philadelphia story the mac character in philadelphia story makes a big deal about wanting to be a novelist and how working for spy magazine is is sort of beneath him and he's just doing it to pay the bills they switched that character motivation for the tracy lord character whereas in this she's upset that dex isn't following his orchestral dreams whereas in the philadelphia story she's upset that mac isn't following his brilliant american novelist dreams they just swapped it between the two characters i don't think she ever really has a desire to end up with either of them and i don't know if either movies ever made you think that either mike mac had a chance that's all part of the discovering who you are sequence for her as opposed to they're always her equivalent of their one night stand where you're just like oh, my eyes are open to the possibilities of the world. 
I never read it as she was going to ever run off with Mike or Mac. It's just, you were my last fling, my last makeout sesh before I got married. And uh, I'm going to change my mind. What is consistent, at least between the two films, is that poor Liz in both versions really does get the short end of the stick. Because I never believe that Ruth Hussey and Jimmy Stewart really genuinely like each other. This film, it's a bit more defined. Celeste Holm is great. She has a really great song with Frank Sinatra. They have a lot of fun together, but Celeste is just hunted to the corner. She gets that really weird, maybe, relationship with Louis Calhoun that's very one-sided. And then at the end of the movie, it's just like, oh, we're in love. Are you, though? Her and Sinatra's character, they declare their love for each other. And I'm just like, no. In 56, they made a lot more jokes about them knocking boots than they did in earlier Philadelphia stories. They make very clear that these two people have a sexual relationship and not a romantic relationship in 1956. She makes it very clear that if he decides he wants to settle down, then I'm here for him because I don't want to just be friends with benefits. Whereas in the Philadelphia story, they just have a working relationship, air quotes, whereas in this, they make it very clear that they also have a bedroom relationship. I'm not saying that there's a chance that Tracy's going to marry him or anything. The songs really add to the chemistry and the plot in this film. The combination, the one-two punch, so to speak, of your sensational and mind if I make love to you really establishes the chemistry between Grace and Frank being more realistic that they become friends with benefits or just run off at the end if she chooses him. I don't think they would get married necessarily right away. He's an option. There's a whole subplot talking about her letting her hair down and her wealth. And he's really the main person inspiring that change in her and telling her that she can still be a good person while caring about others. I would run away with Frank if he sang at me. So would I, right, especially gorgeous. you're sensational. If Frank thinks I'm sensational, I'm going with him, even mm-hmm. if Bing's on the table. Ask Ava yep. Gardner about Frank. I wouldn't have gone off with him. Nope. Nope. I will just say that I have a story in my family where my mom got tickets for free to see Frank Sinatra sing at Madison Square Garden when she was in her early 20s. And they were like front row tickets. Her dad worked for some big company in the city. And she showed up just full 1970s, hippie, ripped jeans, dirty hair, everything. And she said that when Frank turned and looked at her or into the audience while he was singing, she was like, I'm like, I fell so in love with Frank Sinatra. It's not even funny. She was like, I was so jaded going into this. And then when Frank starts singing at you, there's nothing you can do. And it's just like, okay, no, I understand. I get it. This did get nominated for two Academy Awards, predominantly song. It did have best score and best song for True Love, music and lyrics by Cole Porter. Samantha, do you feel that this deserved any additional Oscar love? I'm super biased and there has just been such a systematic anti-comedy, anti-musicals. I would have loved to see a best picture nod at least and... As crazy as it sounds, I don't really know what the competition was like in 1956 off the top of my head. I would love to see Grace Kelly get a nod, just one more nomination before she was sent off to Monaco, because I really genuinely think this is one of her best. So I do have the Best Actress nominees for that year. Your nominees were Ingrid Bergman for Anastasia, Carol Baker for Baby Doll, Deborah Carr for The King and I, Katherine Hepburn for The Rainmaker, and Nancy Kelly for The Bad Seed. Who are you kicking out to give Grace her Oscar nom? I have not seen the last two, so I can't really say, but neither of them sound Oscar-worthy to me. When you think of Katherine Hepburn's filmography and how many freaking nominations she got... I would kick her out probably and give it to Grace. I agree. But I haven't seen The Bad Seed. I know that's another one that seems very against type as far as that getting a nomination. So that's interesting. Nancy Kelly's really great in that movie. I'm okay. Very so, yeah, I don't Oscar. know. I haven't Does seen anybody it. know who won that year? I believe that went to Ingrid. Or... You are correct. Okay, yeah. I have and... seen Anastasia and she's pretty good in it. 
super biased because high society is so much more of a favorite movie for me. I would probably give an Oscar to Grace, but <laughs> Deborah Carr, if not Grace. I will throw out too, if anybody's curious about picture winners or nominees that year, the best picture nominees were The Ten Commandments, Around the World in 80 Days, Friendly Persuasion, Giant, and The King and I. Does anybody know who won that year? My guess is Ten Commandments, but I don't know. Yeah, I would say Ten Commandments or The King and I. You were both incorrect. It was Around the World in 80 Days. Oh, what? okay. Wow. Yeah. A lot of people would probably have said High Society has a better shot than that. I would yeah. have kicked out Friendly Persuasion, probably. <laughs> or Tony Perkins. Just because all of those other ones are such heavy hitters. I'm surprised Giant didn't win. That's a shock to That's me. That's true. I love Giant, actually. I've gotten so much more respect for that movie over the years. Future episode, we need to spend not three hours talking about Giant. I'm glad we got to talk this out because that's what yields a deeper appreciation, if not love, for this movie, is that hearing everybody discuss I can understand why people love this movie, even if I don't love this movie. I still think the Philadelphia story is the OG for a reason. I love it a lot more than this, but I can see why it has its fans. It's beautiful to look at. The Technicolor is great. Those Helen Rose costumes, you cannot go wrong. Grace Kelly does very well. I will agree with Samantha, very underrated as a performer, and she does some good work in this. Bing. Nope. Never going to be a thing with Bing. And Frank is just there. I've seen better from him. This is not a win for me, but I'm glad that we did not end this episode in tears. So, yay. Samantha, our birthday girl, final thoughts on High Society. Pretty much the same way that you do in the reverse. I totally understand why people don't like this movie. The Technicolor does Bing and Frank no favors, and it's sexist. And there are definitely some digs I could make about this movie. The Calypso makes no sense in Newport. You're so right, Emily. <laughs> what could even bring but, up Louis Armstrong? I just kept oh, writing is the Greek chorus, which is really upsetting to Louis. I love his color commentary, though. I do. After the songs, he just gives his two cents, which you never see in a movie, which I love. When Bing sings I Love You, Samantha, which, spoiler alert, my fiance told me he's walking down the aisle to that, you guys. I don't think I'm going to be able to hold it together. Because he knows how much I love this movie. After he sings the little girl song, he's like, great song, wrong girl. <laughs> Which is like so funny. Louis wasn't much of an actor. We know that. But just hearing his little quips is hilarious. One of the best things about High Society is that we have all of this for posterity. That's one of the biggest things for me. You have Bing and Frank singing a song together, which never happened. I, I have to say that again, because it's so crazy and cool. Louis Armstrong in a movie, Grace Kelly looking perfect. Just that we have all these things on film, I'm so happy about. So I love this movie. Emily, you want to take us out with your final thoughts? I see why you love this movie so much. I really do. It's light and it's fun and it's enjoyable to watch. And the costumes are too die for. I'm surprised she didn't get any kind of nomination for those gowns. I love any movie with gowns. And it's this pure, lovely fantasy that's taking place in the 1950s, where the fantasy was really starting to come off of America. And I really felt like this was a wonderful last hurrah of Grace is going to go become a princess now. And now we get to watch her being in a perfectly grace role where she's fun and she's light and she's fluffy and everybody loves her. Everything is beautiful and nothing hurt of a movie. And I really, really like it. I've expressed that I will probably always prefer the Philadelphia story just because I do love the snappiness. I do love the intelligence. I do love these three brainiac heavy hitters doing something as silly as falling in love. But I really like this. Perhaps without Bing Crosby, he's really the weak point of this for me. And I wish they had just gotten someone maybe 10 years younger. But you are right that I love the scene where they're singing together. And he makes a crack about how Frank is the next generation. You're a younger guy. And you... One of my favorite like lines. A, it's so good. And Frank is sloppy drunk. 
and Bing is a polished drunk and it's perfect for who they probably were in real life. And I just really like the elements of it. But man, did they have big shoes to fill remaking the Philadelphia story. Frank was the younger generation and he was just 10 years younger. I just have to throw in one more thing that I got into listening to the soundtracks of these movies on Spotify and everything. I've got my old movie playlists. That line, the little quip, you must be one of the newer fellas. They take that out of the Spotify version. So if you listen to that song on Spotify, it's not even there, which upsets me to no end. Let us know your thoughts on the Philadelphia story, High Society, Bing, Bob, all of them. Whoever is in this movie and whoever is not in this movie, you can tell us that we're on all social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, email, ticklishbiz at gmail.com. We love hearing from all of you. So Samantha Ellis, where are you on the interwebs? Where can fans find and get in touch with you? I am mostly at Classic Film Geek on Twitter, but you can find my blog at musingsofaclassicfilmatic.com and my Cooking with the Stars posts over at classicmoviehub.com. Emily Edwards, what about you? I am across all social media platforms, yes, including Twitter, at Ms. Emily Edwards, and you can also find me at MsEmilyEdwards.com. And you can find me over at TheWrap.com. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram at KristenLopez88. That's going to close out Ticklish Business for today. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get podcasts. Reviews matter. So consider leaving us one on Apple Podcasts. Five stars should do. You can follow us on Twitter at Ticklish underscore biz, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Ticklish Biz. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content like our upcoming literary adaptation series that Emily and I are doing. So consider helping us out at patreon.com slash ticklish biz. Me and Emily both have books out. You can order them wherever you get books. We will be back on September 27th with a new episode celebrating Warner 100. Till then.